Welcome back to the dark side. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Are you not talking to me when you say that? I'm talking to the audience. Oh, they say thanks. Welcome back to the dark side audience. I'm your host, Brianna. And I'm Dyson. And you're Dyson. Yes, I am. Resident Knob Wench. Wah. How are you? How are you today? Oh, you know I'm good. You're good. I've been I've been feasting on the the uh, catering offset for a little <laughs> while. I got the meat sweats. <laughs> offset. Offset. <laughs> yes, we're very elite. Out of studio. <laughs> Out of studio. Offset. Mm-hmm. Eating deli meats, getting meat sweats. Oh yeah, kubasa. 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 How do you feel that every time that you have to? come to Brantford it's like a huge snowstorm Uh, I'm getting used to it but there's always a lot of drifting on the way I uh car in front of me though uh as I pulled into Brantford was um M-A space R-K it was mock (laughs) I'm not even kidding the license plate the license plate said mock and I, oh. I pulled in and I was like, oh, hi, mock. <laughs> I was going to say, I hope out loud you went, oh, hi, mock. Hi, mock. You're my favorite road hazard. <laughs> and welcome to our episode where we just dissect the room Oh. and all of its glory. All right. So our sanity is going to take a hit this episode. Got it. What do you mean? It'll restore it. It's not even bad. It's not even a bad movie. Cinematic masterpiece. Oh, why the uh, the first thing I thought about is that is like the horrible sex scenes that he makes everyone watch. You don't like that? <laughs> Doesn't do it for you? And that fucking kid. Like, why is that kid always there? I don't know why that kid's always there. That's super uncomfortable. The way he fucks her belly button because he's way too high <laughs> in the sex scenes also makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> the whole movie makes me uncomfortable, really, Brianna. If I'm being honest with you. So it's a true crime. It's a true crime. It is honest to God a true crime <laughs> that that got made, but it's also, it's, it's why we're here, right? Imagine one day we just watch it and just like record our reactions to it. It would be so silent because it would just, our jaws would be on the floor like, what's happening? Yeah, I, I'd be speechless. <laughs> it's okay. All right, from one travesty to another, <laughs> why are we here today? Well... I've gathered you all here today. Oh shit! To tell you that I'm excited. Okay. To take you all out of Forest City. We're not gonna be there. Yay! We're not gonna be there. Yeah. I know I already said that, but and then I also said that, like, oh, you know, this was really, really like rough research. It was so dark. Next week it's gonna be like a little more lighthearted, a little different. mm Hmm. How'd that turn out? <laughs> oh, no. I lied. I lied to all of you. Oh, you bitch. Oh, you bitch. You bitch. It's not, it's not any better. It's, it's, it's just as dark. Well, it's pretty dark. Yeah. It's pretty dark. But still, we're going to leave Forest City, and we're going to go back even further in time, almost 100 years ago. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Almost yeah. 100 years ago. Wow. And... Like old times. Did I peek that when I clapped? No. Like old times. I'm going to set the scene for real, not like last week when I trolled you and made you listen to all of the reasons that the 70s were horrible. (laughs) Oh, my God. And I am learning that there are so many reasons. So many reasons. So many events, people, everything make the 70s horrible. Yeah. And I stand by it. Congratulations to everyone who made it out alive because the 70s were wild then. Yeah. Um. For all the shit you give the newer generations, I'd just like to remind everyone that it is, you go around these days and you knock on someone's door, they're probably not going to answer it. And that's why we're surviving better, okay? <laughs> we are aware now. Yeah, I don't give a shit for not answering unknown phone calls or random appearances at our door. I was also going to say, like, we don't hitchhike anymore, but I'm alarmed at how many people do hitchhike still. Yeah, that's still a thing. Whatever. Okay, so you ready for it? In remote communities <laughs> where no one's there to hear you scream. We're always being watched. The birds are drones. Yeah, the birds are are drones. And um, there's fluoride in the water, which is is good for your teeth, but 
but also good for big government that wants to mind control you. <laughs> Did you have too much fluoride today? <laughs> In the microphone, you can just hear. Fluoride. Fluoride. Yeah. It's all coffee, Brianna. I know. I know. And meat sweats. And meat sweats. You're, you're jittery from coffee and sweaty from meat. I shouldn't have had all that kubasa. <laughs> Why are you saying kubasa? How is it pronounced? Is it not kubasa? Oh no, it's the tzatziki tatziki thing all over again. Oh my god. I'm not. It's kubasa. That's how you say it. Thanks. Okay. It's kubasa. Why? What do you call it? Kabasa. <laughs> A kabasa. I'm gonna set the scene for you. I'm so okay, nice. all right. And I'm tired of hearing <laughs> like your fucking butt head. I'm really excited to just say something, but I just it all gets three stooges syndrome when it gets stuck in the doorway and nothing comes out. Three stooges syndrome. Yeah. That's a great way to describe you, Kubasa. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, take me there. Take me there. Okay, no. Don't do this. Please? I'm gonna take you there. Okay? Okay. I'm gonna set the scene. Mm -hmm. It's 1922. The legendary Betty White was born in 1972. Oh, rest in peace, Betty. Topical. Gummy bears were invented. Mm. People were listening to Fats Waller, fangirling over Babe Ruth, and watching Nosferatu. Oh, Nosferatu. Yeah. Oh, fun fact about that. Uh, in in Bram Stoker's Dracula from 1897. Sunlight isn't fatal to Dracula. It just drains a lot of his powers. And it wasn't until this film in 1922 that sunlight was first depicted as being like deadly to vampires. I didn't know that. Yeah, fun fact. Wow. Also in 1922, the discovery of King Tut's tomb influenced Art Deco and repopularized the use of eyeliner in the West. And is a fantastic prelude to... A wonderful Brendan Fraser movie. <laughs> Tarzan. Oh, Tarzan. The Mummy. The Mummy. Yeah, I'm not going to do The Mummy dirty like that. It's like my favorite movie of all time. I know. Well, Brendan <laughs> Fraser's your favorite person of all time. I love you, Brendan. Yeah, I won't tell Kobe. Don't, call, don't tell Kobe. He just meowed. What was that? That was Kobe. He doesn't just meow from the other room. It's not like a kid. I'm pretty sure that was Kobe. Kobe. I am your daughter. That did not sound like Kobe. That was creepy. It sounded like Kobe to me. Could we get a playback? We literally could. Okay. All right, pause. All right, so that wasn't Kobe. <laughs> It was not Kobe. It was either a ghoul or a child, but they're the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Oh, that's terrifying. Okay, so I left off at uh, King Tut. Um, the discovery of King Tut's tomb influenced Art Deco and repopularized the use of eyeliner in the West. And it's still popular today. Oh, yeah. Nice cat eyes, by the way. Thank you. It's my signature makeup. Mm-hmm. All telephone service in Canada and the U.S. was silenced for one minute on August 4th to mark the funeral of Alexander Graham Bell. Oh, I didn't know they did that. I know, right? I had to mention it because, like, duh, we're in Brantford. The telephone city. It's the telephone city. Yeah. F. Scott Fitzgerald coined the term the Jazz Age. You know, I love me some F. Scott Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. Love him. He's one of the best. Yeah. And today... I'm going to tell you a case that is widely believed to have inspired parts of The Great Gatsby. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. On September 16th, 1922, the bodies of an Episcopal reverend and a member of his choir were found dead in a field in Somerset County, New Jersey. The reverend had been shot once in the head, and the choir member had been shot three times in the head, and her throat was slashed ear to ear. And it was mutton chops. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> he got in a time machine. The chops have become sentient. <laughs> okay. The pair was positioned side by side after death underneath a crab apple tree. And their love letters were torn up and scattered between their bodies. 
The trial was a tabloid sensation with wild characters like the star witness nicknamed Pig Woman and a suspect with a walrus mustache. No. I Bu- love it. I buckle, love it already. Buckle up for the Hall Mills murders. All right. So it was around 10 a.m. on Saturday, September 16th, and 15-year-old Pearl Balmer and 23-year-old Raymond Schneider decided to go for a walk in the countryside of New Brunswick, New Jersey. They turned onto DeRussey's Lane, an undeveloped road near an abandoned farm, in hopes of finding some privacy. Oh. It was like well, a notorious like lover's lane. <laughs> there's, there's two of them. Menage a deux. <laughs> mm-hmm. Freak. People are gonna hate me this episode. I'm just so <laughs> strung out on coffee. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I got meat sweats and coffee jitters. Whispering weird French idioms into the mic. Oh, menage oh. toi, but there's two. <laughs> oh. Okay, so they went. To, they were, uh, turned onto like an undeveloped road near an abandoned farm and hoped to find some privacy. This area was like known as a lover's lane. Mm-hmm. They walked a short distance, and Pearl noticed something at the edge of the road. So she pointed it out to Raymond, because uh, she thought it was like two people lying underneath a crab apple tree. But mm-hmm. as they walked closer, they realized the couple was dead. Okay. So, so they ran to a nearby home and called the police. Yeah. So New Brunswick, it's so confusing because if you hear New Brunswick, you think of yeah the province. Yeah. But New, New Brunswick is like the city. Yeah. In New Jersey, okay? Gotcha. So New Brunswick patrolman Garrigan and Officer Curran were ordered to investigate. They arrived on scene and discovered two dead bodies lying on their backs underneath a crabapple tree with their feet pointing toward it, and the woman's head was resting on the man's right arm. She was wearing a blue dress with little red polka dots on it. She was wearing black silk stockings and brown oxfords, and her blue velvet hat was next to her body on the right. Her left hand rested on the man's right knee, and a brown silk scarf soaked in blood was wrapped around her neck. The man's face was partially covered by a Panama hat, and he had on blood-spattered glasses. Their clothes were perfectly in order. Scattered pieces of torn paper lay between them. There was a small blood-stained business card perfectly placed against the man's left shoe, and the grass around their bodies was totally trampled. Mm. They also noticed that the bodies were right at the city limits. Oh. Curran went to call in the murder while Garrigan took a closer look at the scene. He saw the woman's neck was covered in maggots. He found a wallet lying open on the ground, and inside was a driver's license belonging to Edward Wheeler Hall, of 23 Nichols Avenue in New Brunswick. The business card at the man's feet belonged to a Reverend Edward W. Hall, pastor of the Episcopal Church of St. John the Evangelists in New Brunswick. He also found a 32 caliber cartridge case and a two-foot piece of iron pipe near the bodies. Okay. Now, Curran and Garrigan regrouped and waited for more officers to arrive because right off the bat, they're like, what the fuck do we have on our hands here? Mm -hmm. They were with, like, remember, they were with the New Brunswick Police Department, which is Middlesex County. But the crime scene was actually in Franklin Township, which is Somerset County. So as everyone was talking logistics, onlookers came onto the scene and they started taking souvenirs and oh this they, they found that little business card so they started passing it around to read it so any physical evidence was completely compromised and the police had no control on the scene how do you even how does that even happen even if your jurisdiction like does not does not someone just get together and go like yeah regardless like one cop from ours one cop from yours just goes over there and stands guard i i think that maybe like they had never seen anything like this in the area and like like you said, there was huge conflict over jurisdiction, and no one no one could come to an agreement as to exactly who was in charge because it was reported to Middlesex County, but it was technically in Somerset County. So while they were still fighting over jurisdiction, mm-hmm. 
the Kun Kumption Agreement, the undertaker from Somerset County was ultimately called to take the bodies since that's where they were found. Right. And around it was around 2 p.m. And he examined the, the victims. He noted that there was 61 cents and two handkerchiefs in Edward's pockets and that his watch was missing. I like to imagine that he wore his watch every single second of his life. So there was like a it was like pale. <laughs> he had like tan lines around it. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's such a, unless like in 1922, do you think everyone had a watch? If you were a man on the town, you had your watch or else you were naked. Uh, I feel like at the time it was a, it was a new trendy thing to do because they're just getting out of the pocket watch era. True. So if you were anyone of status, especially the local reverend, you had a wristwatch. Yeah, you had a wristwatch, but you're also a bit of a traditionalist, so you had your handkerchiefs. Two, like doubling up. You got a runny nose there, Edward. Crying to give such beautiful sermons. Yeah. Sermons. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. By the way, like I'm not religious in any capacity i don't subscribe to organized religion repent <laughs> repent okay so Lamb of God. so the undertaker at the scene assessed well, what he had on his hands there oh cool this is what's in his pockets i don't know i guess that he had to figure out what was in his pockets he took the bodies back to his hearse and he estimated that the time of death was approximately 36 hours ago which meant that they were murdered around 2 a.m on friday morning it also meant that no one had noticed them in a day and a half, which was very, very weird because they were on, like, they were found on a lover's lane on the weekend. So a popular area. A popular area. Yeah. And no one noticed, no one ever reported it. So they were, like, had, like, you know, they speculated, like, mm, I bet that people noticed but didn't say anything. Especially because, like, it's a lover's lane. It's a quote unquote private area. People go there to get away. You don't know, like maybe they, what kind of couples are out there. Maybe. They also sounded like they were posed in a oh, way that's a little bit of a distance, like under the shadow of a tree or something, and also like lovingly lying on each other. Yeah, they were totally so, posed, obviously. Yeah. And yeah, that's true. And uh, there's like a map of the crime scene. And it's kind of like where the tree is and where it's coming to the city limits. Mm -hmm. It's kind of around a bend. So maybe nobody noticed them. Mm -hmm. But so once the bodies were moved, the undertaker took them. The investigators had a chance to look at all of the torn papers, and that's when they realized that they were love letters and romantic cards that someone had like shredded and ripped up and placed and scattered all around the bodies. Oh, that's vindictive as fuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at the morgue, as the undertaker removed Edward's coat, um, a bullet fell to the floor. It was okay. it was a. 32 caliber which is the same type of cartridge that was found at the scene that's just <laughs> god he must have just gotten to work today and we're like this could be a great day <laughs> shit's just landing in my lap now scramble like it might as well have just pulled out his pocket and saw like one note not shredded up and it just says i did this sign the killer <laughs> i live at this address <laughs> The undertaker from New Brunswick arrived to pick up Edward's body, since that's where Edward lived, but the woman was still waiting to be identified. She would ultimately be identified by a reporter from a local paper that recognized her, because it was like a smaller town. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned, little Looky Loos just came up on that scene. And obviously, that came a lot of reporters. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. So the reporter was like, hey, you gotta figure out who that lady is yet? Okay, no? Well, I'll just tell you because I already know. Yeah, I already got a great look when I was compromising your crime scene. And they immediately knew who Reverend Hall was because the, the license and his business card. But even without needing, like they didn't even need the local reporter to identify the woman because most people already knew who the woman was. Her name was Eleanor Mills, and the affair between her and the Reverend had been obvious to everyone around them for years. Oh. Scandalous. Scandalous. All right, so now we know the names of the victims. Let's learn a little bit more about them. Mm -hmm. We'll start with Eleanor. Eleanor 
Reinhardt Mills was born in 1888. She was married to James Mills, who was 10 years older than her, and they were married when she was only 15 years old. Sounds about right for the time, <laughs> I, I guess. Know. I know. Plus, actually, if you think about it, so she was 15. It would have been 25. Duh, that's math. Um, <laughs> the, the, the couple that found their bodies, she was 15, and the dude was like 23. Oh. So I don't know. I guess it was like, a, I got to subscribe to a certain age limit. I don't know. Love Ooh. and sippy cups were in the air. That's I so hate that. upsetting. <laughs> and it doesn't help that we're talking about how like you have meat sweats. So you're just like a sweaty meat eating guy talking about sippy cups. <laughs> Sorry for it. Like I said, I'm all strung out on coffee. You're going to hate me this episode. <laughs> okay. So they had two children together. Charlotte, who was 16 at the time, and Daniel, who was 12. The family lived at 49 Carmen Street in New Brunswick, New Jersey, in a rundown home only five blocks from the from Edward Hall. So the okay. Reverend. Yep. There's going to be so many names, by the way. Ask, just ask if you get confused, okay? Mm-hmm. She was described as small, slender, and pretty with a passionate soul. It was widely known that she was not satisfied with her marriage. James used to be a shoemaker, but he recently became the sexton at St. John the Evan- Ev- Evang- Evangelist. God damn it. St. John Evangelist. St. John the Evangelist Episcopal Church. Well. Yeah, that's a hard one. And a full-time janitor at the Lord Sterling Elementary School. He worked Uh-oh. he worked hard. But he didn't really have any ambitions. He didn't make much money. Apparently, like, the most he'd make in a week is $38. So Eleanor found solace in romantic novels and church activities. She went to St. John's almost every day where she was very active in the church and had been a soprano in the choir since she was 14. There was tons of rumors about other women involved with the church and choir that were jealous of her because she was head of the choir. And Reverend Hall paid special attention to her. Why is that always the story when it's churches? <laughs> I know. Oh, this they get so juicy. they get so bickery too. <laughs> and whenever it's like that era, and it's like, oh, the mm-hmm. father's coming to dinner. <laughs> get the good china. Get the pewter. Get the pewter. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a little bit about Eleanor and her husband, yep. James. Let's meet the second victim. Edward Wheeler Hall. He was born in 1881 to a middle-class family and was raised in Brooklyn, New York. He received a degree in liberal arts from the Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute and attended Gen- uh, General Theological Seminary in Manhattan. What the fuck is that? To, to become like a, a priest. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> After graduation, he moved from New York to Basking Ridge, New Jersey, and then to St. John the Evangelist Episcopal Church in New Brunswick, where he met his wife, and they married on July 20th, 1911. Now, his wife's name is Frances. She was born into a wealthy family on January 13th, 1874, which makes her seven years older than her husband. People gossiped about their marriage and that Edward only married her for her money and her status. Now, Edward, his wife, Frances, and her 50-year-old brother, Willie, all lived together at 23 Nickel Avenue. Frances and her brother inherited that house along with $2 million after their mother died. And Willie lived with them because he couldn't live on his own, most likely due to some sort of intellectual disability. It's speculated that his personality was consistent with somebody that had high-functioning autism. Okay. And so at the time, it wasn't something that people were diagnosed with. And because Willie wasn't very responsible and he was unemployed, Edward assumed the role of monitoring monitoring the weekly allowance for Willie. Okay. So that's a little bit more about Edward and his home life. So we're going to go back to the crime scene and the investigation. Mm-hmm. And how the police still couldn't agree on where the murders happened. Right. Yep. We're still there. <laughs> They're still bickering this whole time. And it's not getting any better. So Middlesex County has put up a $1,000 reward for information that helped prove that the murders had taken place there. 
but they're trying to prove it by going to the public. <laughs> but this the bodies so were found petty. in Somerset County. It's so, so petty. It's ridiculous. It's just so stuff that's so frustrating. Yeah. And then it was like it just kept going downhill. So random items were being turned over to the police. Like people were just bringing in random bloodstained handkerchiefs and. Then Charlotte Mills, so that's Eleanor and James's daughter, she found a package of love letters that were between her mother and Edward. And also she found Edward's diary. And then, I don't know, I don't know how she found this. And then James Mills, so Eleanor's husband, sold it to the New York American for $500, which was like a newspaper at the time. Good money, though. But also, dude. <laughs> no. Dude. Dude. And the two county prosecutors were chaotic and they were competing with each other. They were competing to interview people first. They didn't care how they conducted themselves. They just wanted to be like the big man on campus. Judges in both counties were rushing and they were assembling grand juries and urging them to like begin hearing on the cases. But they were like, we don't even have anything. What are we supposed to be hearing? This is so frustrating. It is. It, it was just absolute chaos. And then meanwhile, Francis... Was Edward's wife had like hardly ever even been questioned. They were they just did like really gentle questioning, like so you know where were you? You know I was home. Okay, have a nice day, Francis. Wow, that, that's pretty much oh, it. Oh, because she's she's there in their mindset. She's probably grieving. Well, well yeah, like yeah. She, but... her, her husband was just yeah. found murdered. It's and yeah, and she was a woman but... of status. Oh, gotcha. I was going to say. She's from uh, like, she's yeah, wealthy. And someone close to you just She was married died. to the reverend. Yeah. So she was barely questioned. And then she was in the background and she was hiring her own lawyer to privately investigate her husband's death. At this she, point, that's not suspicious at all because, you know, the investigators are clearly doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> so two weeks passes. There's still no leads. And the governor has to step in mm -hmm. and demand that the two counties cooperate with one another. Because at this point, everyone knows about this murder. Yeah. It was it was crazy. There was a uh, media right on the scene. It was being sensationalized. And obviously, we already have people who are interfering. So it got to the status of cluster fuck. It was an absolute. So the governor fuck. was like, <clears throat> um, "Yeah, both the, of you grow up." Yeah, the governor was like, "Listen, we are like getting calls about what the status of this case is, mm -hmm. and you can't give us one because you're you are not conducting a good investigation. Work together, fucking knuckleheads." Yeah, it's probably what is that's what you would call someone in nineteen twenty two, right? Yeah, a knucklehead. Yeah, yeah, you chowder head. <laughs> So finally, both counties were working together. So they began to kind of like, at least the best they could, situate themselves, get on the same page. Who'd you talk to? I talked to this person. Who'd you talk to? I also talked to that person. Let's go talk to them together and get a solid story. This is the start of a great <laughs> cop comedy. <laughs> yeah. It's a comedy. <laughs> I've laughed a lot this episode. <laughs> Okay, so they were like, okay, you know what? Let's get our ducks in a row. Let's go and interview the prime suspects and the people associated with them. Who are the prime suspects? Yeah, who are the prime suspects, Brianna? The spouse is. Duh, it's always the spouse. <sighs> so they start with James Mills. Mm -hmm. Now. The one who sold the diary. <laughs> I know. I kind of get it. I kind of get it because he's like. Well, he didn't even make very much money. Yeah, and also like. I'm holding on to this guy. I don't care that he's dead. I could sleep in with my wife. Everyone mm -hmm. knows it in town. It's a small town that gossips. And yep. he's like, fuck it. I'm going to make some bank on this then. Should I look up how much $500 was in 1922? Oh, please do. Okay, what do you... I can't believe I didn't do this. I always do this. Yeah, you always do. I thought I thought you had it like just in your notes. You're holding on to it. No, I wasn't. All right, let's, let's figure it out. 500 bucks. Let's see. You could probably buy a house for $10. Um... A nickel bought a bubble gum. I think a penny did. Penny bought a bubble gum. Penny candy. Nickel bought the machine. Oh. Okay, it was $8,297.68. Pretty good money. So almost $8,300. Yeah, pretty good money. That's wild. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. <gasps> the inflation is 1,559.54%. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so he, he sold that to a paper, you said? Yeah, it's called the New York American. Uh, so it's like he, a, probably a magazine or a paper. Yeah, papers that buy evidence like that are <laughs> tabloids. always tabloids. They're always sketchy. Yeah. So, yes, that's the man we're talking about right now. Uh, he was really cooperative, though, and he believed that the motive was robbery. He claimed he didn't know about the affair, even though Edward was over at their place all of the time, which neighbors and people in the church all confirmed. Mm-hmm. But James said it's because they were friends. They worked together. Edward had even paid for a major surgery for Eleanor eight months before the murder when James was unable to, and he was driving her to and from the hospital when she needed checkups. Right. But they're just best friends. Yeah, they're just friends. Police continued interviewing him to construct a timeline, which starts at 5.45 p.m. on the day of the murders. James had been cleaning at work until 5.45 p.m. Witnesses confirmed, and he got home at about 6.15 and ate dinner. After dinner, he went out onto the porch to do some woodworking, and Eleanor left to go and make a phone call to to Reverend Hall. She came back briefly and left again. Apparently, when James was like, yo, where are you going? She said, follow me and find out. So, in other words, a wonderful deflection. <laughs> yeah, he didn't. He said he didn't follow her, though. No? Well, probably because, you know, he, he, he already knew where she was going. Oh, is it blissfully happy mm-hmm. yeah and so he just kept working on the porch until about 9 45 p.m where he decided to read the paper and he noticed that someone had cut an article out of it at 10 30 p.m he went to the church to look for his wife he stopped for some soda on the way which was corroborated and then he arrived at the church at around 11 but she was not there so he went home and he went to bed then he woke up again at 2 a.m and she still wasn't home so again he went to the church to see if she was there. She woke and... up at 2 a.m. Mm-hmm. When he went to the church. Mm-hmm. So he left the house at 2 a.m. Mm-hmm. Put a pin in it. Well, also, uh, listeners at home, I'm aware it's blissfully ignorant and blissfully happy is just saying happily happy. <laughs> but I'm there for you if you were yelling at me. So anyway. Um, All right. Well, get your head in the game. Yeah. 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 2 a.m. This dude just left the house. Yep. And he went to back to the church again. And he... She still wasn't there. So it's the next morning. It's Friday. He went to work at the church without reporting his wife missing. At 8.30 a.m., he encountered Frances Hall, so Edward's wife, who mentioned that her husband had not come home the night before. He, James asked her, like, oh, do you think that they eloped? Uh And she was like, God knows. I think they are dead and can't come home. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) Okay. These two are outdoing each other. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so he was just like, okay, anyway. And then, uh, like, throughout the day, they ran into each other. And each time, Francis would be like, so we heard anything? Any news? And he was like, no, no, I haven't. And each time that she was asking him, she would just keep saying, like, yeah, they must be dead. So while James was making his rounds, cleaning the church, he went into Edward's office and noticed a newspaper clipping on the desk. And it looked like the one that could have been missing from his own paper. So he looked at it and it was an article on a prominent minister's views on divorce. Oh, my God. James and Eleanor's daughter, Charlotte, would later confirm that her mother had clipped that article from the newspaper and had told her she was going to go and take it to Edward. Oh, okay. So literally everyone knows about this affair. Yeah, this is so not... for James to sit there and be like, I don't know. They were like, dude, come on. Your own children know about it. Yeah. So the next day, Saturday afternoon, James heard that his wife's body had been found and he went directly to the Hall's house. Oh. Yeah, and he didn't go anywhere that, you know, makes sense. The police like, station or the crime yeah. scene. Yep. He went to the Hull's house. We don't know what happened. But, I mean, you can guess that he probably went to Francis and been like, hey, you know all those comments you were making about how they were probably dead? Well, they are. Yeah. So. And now you look super suspicious. Yeah. So investigators concluded that James's alibi was pretty tight. 
and didn't believe that he murdered Eleanor and Edward, but they did determine when they were talking to him that he was like what they called simple and that he he definitely knew about the affair even though he denied it and they figured like it was probably an ego thing to not have to admit it and he was also probably taking advantage of the money that Edward was contributing to their household. Cuz he was like paying for her surgeries and helping out and stuff. Okay. Yeah. So they so were it was like beneficial to his circumstance. Yeah, so they were like okay, like I don't we don't really think that he did it, but like this guy's lying about the affair. Literally everybody knows about it. Yeah. So like just get on board with this. Mhm. So obviously next on the suspect list was Francis. Yeah. So she claimed that she trusted her husband and that she didn't know about the affair. <laughs> and she's not a simple gal, is she? She hired a lawyer already. Yeah, she's already out here with her fucking private lawyer investigator guy. I love that it's a lawyer investigator. Yeah, I was like a yeah, I was a lawyer. It said a lawyer. Um maybe a former lawyer, I don't know, but it did say lawyer. I hope at some point you tell me the lawyer says, "No, nah, I'm no <laughs> big city lawyer." Oh my god, that's the next line. Oh, shit. Sorry to steal your thunder. <laughs> you can have it. Mm. I did nail that. It was good. Thanks. So on the day of the murders, Frances made preserves in her kitchen. What kind of preserves do you think Frances makes? Prunes. Pickled eggs. Pickled eggs. Oh. Because <laughs> oh. oh. she wants to keep them on the shelf for so much longer than they should. <laughs> preserves in her kitchen and that was probably something yummy let's pretend it was something yummy like pickled beets or something yeah <sighs> do you like beets yeah me too i love them mm -hmm. or maybe she was just making jam or maybe she was preserving edward's head no, i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> so she was making preserves in her kitchen she asked you she needs you to know it was her kitchen okay i just thought that was funny yeah i don't know whenever someone's preserving stuff i don't I just immediately picture the cellar. I know, but that's where you keep it. You keep yeah. it in the cellar. But yeah. I guess you need the kitchen to actually make the preserves. Mm -hmm. I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> okay, so so she was making preserves in her kitchen. Yep. She received a call from Eleanor and gave Edward the message when he got in at 6.30 p.m. And Eleanor called again at 7. Around, and around 40 minutes later, Edward said he was going to go and check on her medical bills. So I don't know. I think maybe he, because he had paid for that surgery for her. Right. I think maybe he was keeping everything in his office at the church. And she was going to go and meet him at the church anyway. So I think that they were just going to go and meet at the church. Yeah. I don't, th whatever, fucking Edward. I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how the fuck these guys have straight faces when they're like, oh, I'm just going to go check on her medical bills. I, like, <laughs> I don't need, uh. It's what God would have wanted. <laughs> So Frances, she says that she just played solitaire for the next two hours. Her brother Willie came out of his room. I don't laugh, Kay. I could play solitaire for two hours, too. Those are preservatives. Where's her cats? I'm really upset right now. Yeah. So she played solitaires for the next two hours. Her brother Willie came out of his room to say goodnight, and then she decided that she'd go to bed, too. At, a, at you know, maybe 2.30 a.m., she woke up, and she realized her husband wasn't home. So she woke up her brother, Willie, to go with her to the church and look for him. And the, But the church was dark. So they walked past the Mills house, too. But it was dark. So, you know, they just went home. Before you say anything. Yeah. A night watchman at the local college that I think is like right across the street from the Hall's house. He saw that the lights were on all night and he saw a woman enter the home at 2 30 a.m not leave it like francis said she left at 2 30 a.m mm -hmm. not suspicious at all all of this is super <laughs> weird and why are they all waking up ex like Get spontaneously ready. at two i oh yeah i know oh i don't know just it's two i guess oh, i gotta get up for a little midnight preserve snack mm -hmm. so francis admitted to anonymously calling the police on Friday morning to ask if anyone was found hurt or dead, which no one had been at the time. But she claimed that after the call, she just continued to search for her missing husband all day. But that contradicts James' story, who said that he saw her multiple times on Friday and he 
kept she kept asking them for updates where she just kept saying, oh, they're probably dead. Yeah. Meanwhile, in the morning, she had called and was like, so, you know, did you anyone find anything weird? Maybe a dead guy, maybe a dead woman, maybe they're hurt. Like, She's really hung up on. And that was being... Friday morning. So yep. the cops were like, what? No. Who is this? And she was just like, hmm, hung up. Didn't tell them, but she admitted to this. And she's doing it anonymously, like it's not someone. Like, and it was on Friday. The bodies with... weren't even found till Saturday morning. So a reporter called her on Saturday, just like when James had found out it was a Saturday, because that's when the bodies were found. Mm -hmm. That was stupid. <laughs> a reporter called her on Saturday, which is how she heard the news of the murders. And like James, she believed that the robbery was that robbery was the motive, since Edward's gold watch was missing. And the undertaker, who was obsessed with Edward's pockets, had only <laughs> had found that there was only 61 cents in his pocket. Yeah. And she was like, oh, see, robbery is definitely the motive because he always carried $50 in his wallet. And there wasn't $50 in his wallet. Right. So she was like, so that's definitely it. His watch is missing and he only has 61 cents. Well, it's robbery. Yeah. Conveniently what James thought as well. Investigators spoke to the Halls's Halls's? Halls? Halls. Halls apostrophe. <laughs> the Halls's. Hall Halls's. Halls's. Halls's, yeah. So investigators spoke to their maid, who mm -hmm. corroborated that the 7 p.m. call from Eleanor did come in. Edward did leave the house 40 minutes later, and Frances was playing solitaire for a couple of hours. But she added something else that was, let's say, suspicious. Oh, now it's suspicious. So in the morning... She saw Willie, and he told her that something terrible happened last night, and Mrs. Hall and I have been up most of the night. But he wouldn't elaborate. The maid was like, Willie, what? And he was like, mm, I'm not telling you. It's a secret. It's a secret. Creepy. Yep. Uh, no one's looking good so far, let me tell you. While talking to eyewitnesses, investigating the spouses, establishing a timeline, all of the stuff investigators should be doing, they uh, learned that no autopsies had been conducted on Edward and Eleanor. That guy really was fixated on the pockets. He didn't give up the pockets. He's closed. I need this coat and I'll put the bodies on the ground. <laughs> so naturally, both the bodies were exhumed so that one could be performed. Mm -hmm. You know, two people are murdered, you should probably do an autopsy. Yeah. So it was ter determined that they both had been shot with a 32 caliber pistol, which matches the cartridge found at the crime scene and the bullet that fell from Edward's coat. Never forget about the coat in the pockets. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Edward was shot above his right eye with an exit wound in the back of his neck. It was surmised that someone had shot sean connery all of a sudden oh, shit. it was surmised that someone had shot him from above yeah like like he was on his knees first or some shit yeah so he also had an abrasion um on his hand particularly on the back of his right index finger and his left pinky there was a small bruise on the tip of his left ear and a cut on on the calf of his right leg eleanor's death was way more brutal she was shot three times under her right eye, above her right temple, and above her right ear, with an exit wound in the back of the skull. Her windpipe and esophagus were severed, and there was a small wound on her upper lip, and her arm was bruised. So, so the, these people went through hell. Yep. Then, there was a twist in the case. This entire paragraph is from an essay written by Mary S. Hartman, and I just decided to read the whole paragraph because she just perfectly sums up what happens next, that there's no point in me rewriting it, so. Okay. Others were being questioned in particular. The 15-year-old factory worker, Pearl Bomber, and her sometime 20, she says 22-year-old, it's reported that he's 23 sometimes, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Her sometime 22-year-old boyfriend who had found the bodies. The boyfriend, Raymond Schneider, stated that on the night of the murders, a second young man had been with him 
and that they had followed his girlfriend and her father, who were talking together in the neighborhood of the killing. The boyfriend maintained that his companion, who had also dated the girl, so Pearl, suspected that the father was guilty of incest and intended to do away with him. He swore that this young man, called Clifford Hayes, had killed Edward Hall and Eleanor Mills in a case of mistaken identity. Amazingly, Hayes was arrested and charged on October 9th. Of course, the story did not explain the love letters or the slit throat or a multitude of other things, but clearly the need for an instant suspect was great, given the pressure from the state and the press. Then, too, the suspect conveniently came from the right class, while Mrs. Hall and her brother were highly respected citizens. James Mills was grudgingly left alone for the time being, since neighbors had seen him within an hour of the alleged killings and had heard him doing woodwork, pounding nails, throughout the whole period in question. Soon it was clear the, that only the Somerset prosecutor had wanted an arrest, and Middlesex citizens protested that it was no accident the wealthy folks from Somerset should want to pin the crime on a New Brunswick lad. Hundreds from town called at the boy's home to express sympathy, and a justice fund was created to pay for Hayes' defense. Many of these people knew that Schneider was an inveterate liar. I think that means compulsive. Like a yeah. compulsive liar. And sure thing, a couple days later, the young man confessed to the lie and Hayes was released. The prosecutors were again empty-handed. Then Pearl was interviewed and said she was out on that night, but the quote-unquote other man was her drunk father trying to sober up, and then Schneider confessed to having lied about the whole thing. So everyone was released, oh my and the God. charges against Clifford Hayes were dropped. That's so infuriating. So the whole paragraph was from uh, Mary S. Hartman, mm -hmm. and it just perfectly summed up that whole debacle of the twist that was the arrest for the murders that was just a lie. Yeah. There's a whole detour. <laughs> so when the investigators, like Mary Hartman has said, were empty handed again, and a state Supreme Court judge was unhappy with the botched investigation, and he S turned it over to the state attorney general's office. Yeah. Because he was like, fuck these local investigators. They are making a mess of this. Mm -hmm. And then unlike local prosecutors... The newly appointed state prosecutor took the testimony of a local eccentric woman very seriously. She had come forward in mid-October, after the Hayes accusation, to say that she had been an eyewitness to the crimes and couldn't let an innocent person suffer. <clears throat> local investigators ignored her story because it didn't match up with the autopsy reports, and local residents ignored her story because she was a notorious liar as well. All great reasons so far, by the way. <clears throat> but when the state prosecutor got involved and took over, he believed her story, calling it the most valuable evidence, because if she saw the crime, she would be able to identify the killers. Yeah, and also the prosecutor has probably the most vested <laughs> interest in exactly. believing her. So you're probably like, yo, who is this? Who's this mystery woman, this local eccentric woman? You know what? I bet that she was hoping that everyone in the goddamn world was <laughs> asking that question. She is... Who is this lovely, wonderful, glamorous, mysterious <laughs> woman? I think I would be upset if someone said that I was like the eccentric local woman. I would be like, what the fuck does that mean? Say to my face. And then everyone, when you do that, would probably all just make eye contact and go, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My log has something to say. <laughs> Aw, I like that Don't lady. Don't rush. The fish aren't running. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, God, now I just want to watch Turn Beats. Yeah, sorry. I watched that episode very recently. So good. It's great. So good. Really put me in the mood. Bonsai. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so this local eccentric woman, her name's Jane Gibson, but she was known locally as Pig Woman. <laughs> no. <laughs> Instead of log lady, she's a pig woman. Christ. So close. <laughs> so so she lived with her son, William. Wait, sorry, what was her name again? Doesn't matter. I'm calling her pig woman. Okay. 
<laughs> her name is, is apparently Jane Gibson, but everyone just called her Pig Woman. Okay, it's Pig Woman. <laughs> so she lived with her son, William, in an old barn that was converted into a living space just off DeRussi's Lane. So that's the lover's lane where the crime scene is. Yeah. And uh, she raised hogs. So it's not just a clever name. Okay, <laughs> so she said that Francis, her two brothers, Willie and Henry, and their cousin, also named Henry, oh. were all at the scene on the night of the murder. And she saw brother Henry murder Edward and Eleanor. That's some pointed accusation right there. She told investigators that her dog was barking. It was around 9 p.m. on the night of the murder. So she went outside. She saw, she saw a man standing in her cornfield. So she got on her mule, Jenny, to mm -hmm. approach the man because she thought he was the thief that had been stealing her corn. <laughs> no, I can't. I, she rolled up on a mule. <laughs> hey, you've been stealing my corn? <laughs> Named Jenny. <laughs> That's terrifying. That's terrifying. So she's like, oh, that motherfucker's the guy that's been stealing my corn. How she knows that someone's been stealing her corn, I don't know. I guess maybe it's a small cornfield. <laughs> she's like, fuck, Jenny, let's go. So she hops on her mule. Yep. She's going to go up to this guy who's stealing corn. And as she gets closer, she saw four people standing near a crab apple tree. Then she heard gunshots. And one of the people fell to the ground. And a woman screamed, don't three times she said she turned around headed back to her house on her mule because she didn't want to be a part of that but then she heard more gunshots so when she looked back at the at the tree she saw a second person fall down probably dead mm -hmm. and then she said she heard a woman shout the name henry that's her first story yeah, that's her first story <laughs> so so many problems with that already though exactly like not nine o'clock nine at 9, 9 p.m., her dog was barking, and it, then the, there was the corn thief who and, wasn't a corn thief. It was a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, the, the woman was shot three times. Well, she said she heard gunshots and that the woman screamed, don't, three times. Well, a woman screamed, don't. Yeah. And she turned around, and then she heard more gunshots. Okay. So it's unspecified amount of gunshots, but it's definitely three don'ts. Okay. All right. But two people for sure fell. Yeah, I was gonna say because like there's no way that she heard the gunshots after hearing the don't and then saw the other person drop because that woman yelling don't would have had several bullets in her head by now. You wouldn't have turned around to see her dramatically <laughs> fall and your corn thief just fade into the blackness. And you just ride out like Clint Eastwood and your fucking mule. <laughs> Jenny. <laughs> okay, so that was her story. But then, like, she had to, like, tell this story multiple times because it's the pig woman and she asked it. You have to know. So then she had, she had like, more to add to the story. Mm -hmm. She was like, oh, yeah, but, like, when I was on Jenny, I noticed <laughs> a touring car parked on Easton Avenue. Easton Avenue is the road. There's, like, the main road and DeRussi's Lane comes off of it. Okay. So it's all in the same little area. Uh, there will be a, a map that investigators created that I'll post on Instagram. Ooh. So yeah, you're you'll be able to, to check that yeah, out. you'll be able to see it and kind of follow along. Yeah. Um, so she was on Jenny. She saw a touring car parked on Easton Avenue, which the Halls did own a touring car. What is a touring car? It's like one of those big old timey cars that's used by, and like a chauffeur drives it. Oh, okay. So, like, I don't know. I personally picture, like, an old school, like, Rolls Royce or something. But, oh. like, you know. But a fancy car. It's a chauffeur car. Fancy car for ritzy people. And the Halls did own one because they were fucking Francis was rich as hell. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was when she turned around and cut across a field down a small lane that she saw two men and two women standing near a crabapple tree. And they were really, like, arguing, like, really bitterly. Mm -hmm. But then, like... A car coming into the lane behind her illuminated the people. So she saw their faces and she saw that the woman was wearing a long gray coat and the man had a big mustache and really bushy hair. And then a little later, she said she heard a woman ask, how do you explain these notes? It sounds like it's being driven by the tabloid story. 
It does, right? Yeah. So her story had changed from a person getting shot and falling to the ground to seeing Anne Lenor running away after Edward was killed, but then the group caught Eleanor and then they dragged her back and then they shot her three times. That's mm-hmm. what she says now is what happened. Mm-hmm. But then, like, that's not all, though. Yeah. What did Jenny see? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. She probably, like, she, Pig Woman's probably one of those, like, sick people that, like, blindfold their mules. So oh, that yeah. They get, like, blinders, you know? So, yeah. like, they don't know. And that's probably her excuse. Like, Jenny didn't see anything, okay? She had blinders on. So so now, at 1 a.m., mm-hmm. she realized that she lost a moccasin. So she had to ride Jenny back to look for it. <laughs> and as she approached the crab apple tree, she heard a woman crying, and she saw that it was Frances, who was the woman that was wearing that gray coat, and she was kneeling next to her husband's body, and she was sobbing. Mm-hmm. I don't know if she ever found her moccasin. Yeah. <laughs> That was, that was the first question I wanted to know the answer to. So, like, Peg Woman was a total weirdo, okay? Like, her story changed each time that she, she told it. Several people who knew her came forward about her unreliability, claiming she was known around the neighborhood as a liar. She said that her husband was dead, but when he was alive, he was a minister. But he was actually alive, and he wasn't a minister. He was a tool maker. And the man that she called her son that she lived with was actually her husband. So, ew. Yeah. Oh, she's all over. Get her out of here. <clears throat> Pig woman, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's save Robert Picton's Jenny. mom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. We need to save Jenny. That's all I care about. Yeah. Jenny. Jenny probably ate the moccasin. <laughs> I was thinking that. I was thinking that. She didn't want people to hear her mule, so she shoved a moccasin in its mouth. <laughs> oh my god! Do not spit that beer out. <laughs> That was a close one. I was, I was about to take a whole step right there. So clearly Pig Woman had been telling like all different stories. And she later admitted that she told reporters one story. And she told authorities another. And then she would tell people in the neighborhoods another story. And it She's just bored. snowballed. And I don't know. I guess she liked talking to someone other than hogs. I can't not picture the log lady as her, though. I actually can't. It's funny. As I guess I kind of pictured someone looking like the log lady, too. Yeah. Because I don't actually know what Pig Woman looks like. I saw only saw one picture, and you can't see her face. And... Honestly, it's probably really good because if you did come across her face somewhere, it'd be in the tabloids again, and it'd mm. be for something horrible. So, right, no right, news right, is right, good right. news, I think, with her. Uh, yeah, well, guess what? It's not the last time that we hear about the pig woman. Shit. Okay. So, Mrs. Fraley, she was a woman that lived directly across Dressie's Lane, and she contradicted Pig Woman's story. Mm. She had heard no commotion that night she didn't hear any gunshots nothing and she had boarders that stayed at her house and they didn't hear anything either okay in fact she had seen the pig woman right after the murder supposedly happened and pig woman didn't even say anything now when the when the murder supposedly happened like to the cases version or with her with the with the pig lady that said, "Oh, at nine o'clock." Yeah, so like around time of the like estimated time of death. So. Okay, so the real, real, real time. Some time. Also, the time of death isn't going to be perfect because that Undertaker was really only obsessed with pockets. Yeah, he was really into that. He... And I mean, it's 1922. You know what? When you were telling me that they exhumed him and then they were like, "Yeah, it died from a gunshot wound." I feel like <laughs> the like the the guy was just like, "I fucking told you, no reason to dig him up, right? I was right the first time." I was just holding the bullet. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, he like, rubs it. It's this little worry stone, little necklace he's got. Now. <laughs> little worry stone, <laughs> smooth now. <laughs> so, so that's one person who was like, "Yo, don't trust pig woman." Okay, <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> Good advice. We didn't. We don't. We don't like the hog lady, but you know, pig woman. She always stood by her story, mm-hmm. and by the time that her story was taken seriously by the state prosecutor. That was enough testimony that raised doubts as to where Francis, her brothers, and her cousin had been. So it, like, unfortunately added this credibility to the pig woman's story. This, pro- this prosecutor, though, is so shit so yeah. far. Yeah, he, like, he has an agenda. Build... Yeah, he's got an agenda, but even with the agenda, I would never put her her tail up at all. I'd be like, this is not... This is not part of this case. I'm not He just wanted this. to run with it because he was like, if that shred of hope is that she really did see this. So she saw these people so she can identify them. 
And so like in one account of Pig Woman's story, she mentioned having seen Frances Hall. So like we've already met her. We know that's Edward's wife. Mm-hmm. And we've like sort of met her brother, Willie. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's learn a little bit more about him. Yeah, he's a little bit... Uh... He's hard to peg on this one. Yeah, so he was uh, he was born March 13th, 1872. What does that make him? Aries. Close. Pisces. Pisces. Aries I didn't know what next. came before Aries. Pisces. I, I assumed Aries was the top of the list. People usually do start with Aries, that's right. Don't mm-hmm. let it get to your head, though. I already did. He was described as impulsive, explosive, and somewhat reckless, but usually had a sunny disposition. He wore thick glasses and had a walrus mustache. That's so scary. That's so scary. I thought it was like this, like, you know. The walrus mustache? Yeah, it's terrifying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I, I know what you're saying. We're on though. a facial hair kick at this point. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, I straight up had to Google what a walrus mustache was because I was like, it's no, there's no way it is what I think it is. It's like the... And it's what I thought it was. You know what? I'll show you a picture. All right. Oh yeah, so that's okay. What Willie has? Yeah, thick. one of those like think think an oil prospector. Oh, prospector. Yeah, hundred percent. Maybe a monocle. Mm. Oh yeah, he kind of looks like um the Monopoly guy with the big mustache. <laughs> he does. He does. He does. Yeah. So yeah, so Willie had he wore these big thick glasses. He had a walrus mustache, and most of his free time was spent at the fire station where he played cards and ran errands. Since he wasn't employed and he couldn't fulfill his ambition of being a firefighter, it was discovered that he owned a 32 caliber pistol. Oh no. But the firing mechanism was allegedly filed down for safety reasons. Plus, he said that he hadn't shot the gun in over 10 years, but they still took the gun in for evidence. Yeah. And his alibi that night was Francis, whose alibi was Mustache. So, take that. What you do with that, what you will. Yeah. So Pig Woman also mentioned seeing Francis's other brother, Henry. Mm -hmm. He was born on November 10th, 1869. He was a retired exhibition marksman who lived 50 miles away in Lavalette, New Jersey. But he wasn't close to his sister. Physically, Mm. emotionally. (laughs) Just, yeah, okay, all right, that's good. (laughs) 50 miles away, get it? Uh Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his alibi was that he was on a fishing trip miles away from the crime scene, which was, people did say, yeah, he was with us on this fishing trip. All right. Uh, Lastly, Pig Woman said that she saw Francis's cousin, the other Henry, cousin Henry, Mm -hmm. and he was born May 15th, 1882. He lived with his wife two doors down from Edward and Francis and worked as a Wall Street stockbroker. So he was the... He was in the area as well. He didn't live with Francis like Willie did, but he was just down Part the road. of a ritzy family for sure. Oh, yeah. And he was a Wall Street stockbroker. Yeah. So his alibi for that night was that he had an early dinner with his wife at his home, uh, at, at a home of some friends, and they left together around 10.30 p.m. I guess that's his alibi, but I mean, it's only, you're only going until 10.30 p.m. Yeah. But also, I mean, like, this has already blown that entire story out of the water. Plus, fucking state prosecutor was just obsessed with Pig Woman. And he was like... <laughs> what a fucking idiot. So he, he was like, yo, we gotta bring murder charges down on, on the Hall Stevens Carpenter gang. So let's, let's do it. Let's get a grand jury convened. They're gonna hear from the witnesses. They heard from 67 witnesses over wow. a five-day period. Oh my god, that's a long fucking day. But guess what? No charges were laid in the end, and everyone got on with their lives. You're kidding. I'm not kidding, and guess what else? What? That's where we're going to leave it. The case is far from over, though, so be sure to join us next week for the conclusion. All right. What do you think so far? Thoughts. It's crazy. The story is nuts. It is like something out of a movie. You yeah, know, every time you you're like, okay, okay, I got it, I got it. I don't like the looks of that. Oh wait, what? What? A pig woman in a walrus mustache? She's my favorite so far, but pig I also woman. hate her because it's just ridiculous waste of time. All these people just want attention. I think this town is like so like boring or something that they're like, let's do it. Oh, Get my, my name God. in the paper. Yeah, it's like the tabloids came to town and they just lost their damn mind. Oh. The tabloids. 
So yeah, they did come to town. And they they fucking everyone just submerged, submerged, converged, converged, converged. Like got together. Everyone just went to the scene. Yeah, converged. And when and earlier when I was like, oh, they took souvenirs. Yeah. Uh, from the crime scene. So the everyone that came to the crime scene, the souvenirs they took was literally like pieces of the crab apple tree. So they were like skinning the bark off of it. They weren't taking like, you know, like they literally took the whole tree. Or... How many people came to take souvenirs? They took the bark off the trees, the, the tree, then there was no more bark left. So they started taking little twigs, little branches, old crab apples, and then there was literally no tree left. There was no tree left. They took the tree. That's something really creepy out of like this like dark allegorical story yeah. or something. Like that's something you like There's, I'll post pictures too. There's people literally like taking parts oh, that's of the something tree. like out of a horror movie where the like plot is that the town loses its mind. It's so creepy, right? It's very creepy. I oh, don't like, that. And, like they immediately started doing that while the bodies were still laying there. They started skinning the tree with its bark. Oh. And the area was so like it was like a uh, an attraction like an attraction like people literally were coming obviously to see it check out the grass where the bodies had lain take the bark off the trees and it was so popular that vendors started to post up at the crime scene and they were selling like food trinkets that had people with balloons like it was a fucking party it was sick oh my god it was, it was insanity so yeah everyone please make sure that you come back next week for part two i'll wrap it up i'll give you the conclusion uh so thank you so much for tuning in to the first of two episodes on the hall mills murder if you like the show please rate review and subscribe follow all of that jazz be sure to visit our website darkadaptationpodcast.ca where you can further support the show by buying us a coffee you can follow us on instagram dark adaptation podcast share the show with the spooky bitches in your life Spotify, whatever, listen to us. Thank you for the support and kind words. Thank you for joining us, Dyson. Aww. We'll catch you on the dark side. Bye. They arrived on scene and discovered two dead bodies. Nice. Off to such a hot start. <laughs> My mouth is asleep, I guess. It's killing me not to just say dirty floor apples. <laughs> <laughs> what you no, what? Is that a crab apple? <laughs> crab a dirty apples. floor apple? <laughs> These taste disgusting. They're crab apple. Dirty floor <laughs> apples. <laughs> what is that from? I don't remember. <laughs> I like to, stuck in my brain apparently. I like to imagine it's something you created in your own head could be you talking to you because you're a little freak out there eating crab apples off the ground <laughs> the girl ladies <clears throat> okay no they're all looking terrible so admit, admits talking to these to the eyewitnesses it, witnesses <laughs> Ed, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so while yep. investigators were talking to eyewitnesses, <laughs> I think I'm having a stroke. Oh no. Hold both hands up. <laughs> All right, we're good. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to go for it. Love the tattoos, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> One day I'll have sleeves. Yeah.